where you're visiting. Mm -hmm. Oh, and we're recording. Uh, mm -hmm. Just so you know. Um, so yeah, uh, open up the chat here. And if people want to just say hello, maybe where they're joining from. That would be lovely. Mm -hmm. Okay, we got we got a oh Cape Town. All right. Oh, and, whoa, India. Vikram, what time is it? My goodness. We have a very nicely spread uh, attendee list. <laughs> yes, we do. We do That's indeed. Great. We should Correct. have a map. <laughs> Eight thirty. Oh well. Thanks for staying up. And we'll try to we'll try to keep you awake. <laughs> That'll be our goal. And Ruth from Germany, hey Ruth. Oh, at least give you sweet dreams. <laughs> yeah, we'll try. No night, no nightmares. That'll be our goal. <laughs> Great. We'll give people a few more seconds to roll in. Continue to introduce yourself and chat where you're from. Roberta's from Cardiff. Hey, Roberta. Is it Rute or Root? From Lisbon. It's Rute. Oh, Rute. Rute. Well, I'm glad I asked. Yes. Rute. Rute. Thank you. Welcome. And and uh, Xavier, not Xavier. Xavier. Puta yes. Xavier. Okay. Yes. Welcome. Nice. Wonderful to have you with us. Thank you. Um, okay, folks, there might be some folks who join us um, as we go. Um, it's a delight to be with you. My name is Daniel Wilson. I'm joining you from uh, Project Zero, which is a research center at the Harvard Graduate School of Education. And um, this is an introductory workshop. So you have uh, signed up to be with us for about an hour and a half. Um, we know how busy e e life is. And uh, so we're going to make good use of our time. And I'm delighted that uh, we'll have two uh, uh, colleagues uh, who will be joining me and sharing some of the ideas. In a moment, I'll uh, give them a uh, chance to introduce themselves. But let me just say a few things right out of the gate. Uh, one is uh, we're going to be sharing a lot of information, and there'll be some information that will hopefully feel really resonant with things you already do in your classrooms. And that's really the goal. Uh, we're hoping that there could be some things that you get out of here, which could be new. And I'll I'll cue you to some of the connections that we're hoping you can make. Um, but it is a delight. I am teaching uh, four classes uh, this semester, so I know how busy life can be. And uh, so um, we will get right down to business. Let me share my screen uh, one moment. And everyone see that? Just give me a little thumbs up if you can see that. Yeah. Yes, you can. Thank you. Um, Beautiful. Um, today, we're going to be introducing a framework called um, I-5 or the Impactful 5. Hute, would you have a question? No, I'm sorry. I was trying to put the thumbs up. <laughs> okay, thumbs up. Thumbs up or all four, all five fingers. That works. Um, we're going to be introducing the I-5 framework, and this has been built out of uh, several years of collaboration with professors across every global region of Prime. Um, and uh, I, I will say a little bit about the motivation behind it, but I'm very, very delighted that um, I'll be joined uh, today uh, by two of uh, dear friends and close colleagues with whom we've been collaborating over the almost two years now, uh, Natasha and Christian. Natasha, do you want to just introduce yourself? It says where you're from, but maybe you could say a little bit more about what draws you to this topic of I-5. Yeah, sure. Thank you, Daniel. Um, and it's really great to be on this session, which is the first specialist session that we've been doing. So I've been working with Daniel and Christian through the project, but it's great to come together today. And I see some friendly faces uh, in the participants. So nice to, to see you. Yes, yeah, so I'm a professor of marketing and sustainable business, and I'm also uh, the vice chair of the UK and Ireland Prime chapter. Um, my background is in education and specifically creativity. So anything that combines sustainability, creativity and teaching, uh, I'm in. So that's why I'm here. <laughs> Well, it's a pleasure to always be in conversation with you, Tasha. So thank you for carving out the time to be with us. And Christian, say a little bit about uh, 
who you are and what draws you to this topic. Um, Thank you, Daniel. And it's always a pleasure to be in the room with the the two of you and, and have been on quite a journey with you to get to this point. So hello, everyone. My name is Christian and I'm from uh, the University of Victoria, which is on the very west coast of Canada. And what drew me in and uh, really motivated me to work with this I-5 is the the sense of engaging students. And I don't know your parts of the world, but certainly in my part of the world, it's I think it's an ongoing challenge to excite students and get them to really invest in their, their learning and get them to grab on the material. So anything around playful, uh, creative types of pedagogies is 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 something that is close to my heart. So if I can make it more of an engaging experience for the students, um, I think that's what I-5 does. So happy to be part of uh, this workshop this morning. Terrific. And uh, always a pleasure to be with you, Christian. And uh, for those uh, folks uh, on the Zoom, you'll notice that we have a city background and a country background. As Natasha pointed out, we have country mouse and city mouse. And so I'm going to play the role of suburban mouse. Uh, you can interpret that however you'd like. Um, as I mentioned, I'm Daniel Wilson. That has not changed in the last five minutes. Um, I teach here at the Graduate School of Education. I teach uh, courses on group dynamics and space design. Uh, my research over the last several decades has been around collaboration and uh, group learning. And we were delighted at the research center called Project Zero to be invited into a project uh, with the UN Prime and professors all around the world. And so we'll be sharing the fruits of uh, that work uh, with you today. Here's a quick preview of how we, uh, Natasha and Christian and I thought we would organize our time together. Um, we'll have a quick warm up, so um, that will be a moment, and I'm I'm sure you have asked your students to do the same. That'll be a moment to take uh, yourself um, off of um, I don't know. Let me I'll frame it positively to turn on your video, and we can see each other and uh, share in the warm up. We'll spend the bulk of our time uh, reviewing what we call the I five framework, and these are methods and moves that professors like Christian and Natasha make in their classrooms uh, to support different kinds of pedagogies. And we'll talk about the sorts of pedagogies. But as Christian already noted, uh, really what's bringing us together is we want to support responsible leadership and how we develop responsible leadership in our classrooms. Uh, we'll have a cool down, uh, and that'll be a moment to reflect. Um, and as always, we hope that during uh, the time together, we can have some fun, uh, connect, maybe meet some new people, um, and of course, take away some ideas. So that's a little bit about uh, the agenda. I uh, hope that feels orienting. And now to the point where, um, as promised, I invite you to turn on your camera. So uh, we're going to do uh, what we call kind of a joy scavenger hunt. This is going to be very, very quick, but we want you to look around your environment. Um, and we want you to find something that brings you joy, an object, something you can share with others. So take about uh, 20 seconds, scan your environment, see if you can find an object that brings a smile to your face in those moments when you're feeling a little overwhelmed, it gives you a little bit of joy. Everyone got something? Oh, okay. Uh, if you have something, please hold it up to the camera so people can see it. Oh, wow. Magdalena, um, I see that you sh are holding up something very sweet. T talk talk about your relationship to what's in your hand. Um, it's good that it's still in my hand because actually it's uh, more in my mouth than in my uh, hand. It's dark chocolate <laughs> and I love to eat. <laughs> while having meetings <laughs> <laughs> terrific thank you magdalena and sabrina who's your guest there in your arms and um, this is riley and uh R riley is a year and a half old and he is very 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 cute and huggable oh i i pets i miss having pets when i'm in the office just for that reason <laughs> Um, and and let's see, if, let's hold up the things that you have. Let's see if we can find one other person who could share. Oh, Anne Marie, what is that? Oh, you're on mute, Anne Marie. Hi, I'm a Spanish, and I've got all these wonderful fans with me. You see, oh. but I live in London, so they're completely useless. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> well, but now is the occasion. You found the use. You can share something that brings you joy, um, even if it's a little out of cultural context. <laughs> thank you. And thank you all. And um, it's so lovely to see the different items in our environments that bring us some joy. And I don't know about you, but uh, for me, uh, you know, life can be complicated and very, very heavy. Uh, so finding little pockets of joy, I think, is an important way to start our time together. OK, let me review some of the norms of, of, of our time together. So here are some things that we want to just put on your minds, and hopefully we'll be embodying these over the hour plus that we have together. Uh, one is that remember that what we're going to be talking about are holistic sorts of elements. Uh, we'll be talking about holistic skills, for example. Holistic skills are not just the cognitive skills, but we're talking about social skills, we're talking about emotional skills. So we're talking about sort of a wide range of things. Also, we'll be talking about elements of a framework. And these elements, while we're going to present them as kind of discrete, look, we all know as educators, when we're getting in the in a classroom, when we're planning curriculum, many, many elements are interrelating. So even at the pedagogical level, uh, there'll be lots of holistic um, uh, meanings that we need to honor and recognize in the practice. So remember the holistic as we go uh, forward. Another norm is to check your mindset. So as I mentioned at the outset, um, we're imagining, Natasha and Christian and I are imagining that many of the things that we're going to share will resonate with you. You'll have moments of thinking, oh, you know, I'd do something like that. Terrific. I mean, part of the goals of this framework is to work with, you know, 18 professors, uh, understand their practice and create a framework that will resonate with other professors. So good, good, good if it's resonating. Um, also, there might be some parts which feel somewhat unfamiliar. Uh, good. Uh, so we want to, you know, pique your curiosity a bit. So note those things. Even if something feels a little familiar, you might want to ask yourself, uh, how, can, how is this unfamiliar? How is this new? So as you're listening, we want you to be thinking about how you can adapt the ideas, not just replicate ideas, but really, you know, fit your own kinds of needs, your students' needs, and the kinds of goals you have. Uh, for your teaching. Remember the holistic, check your mindset. And the third is prepare to interact. So there will be multiple moments where we're going to invite Natasha and Christian to share a little bit of some windows into their classrooms. Uh, we want you to ask questions. We want you to make connections. Uh, so feel free to activate the chat. I'll uh, I'll be monitoring that as best I can. Natasha and Christian, I'll invite you to do the same. Uh, just so if we see some questions that are popping up, uh, we can respond to them. Um, in the flow. Uh, we're not a large group, so we want to give ourselves some elbow room to personalize this experience. So if there's things that are interesting to you, flag them, and then we can decide if we want to go down uh, those pathways. Remember the holistic, check your mindset, and prepare to interact. And we'll do everything we can um, uh, to keep those of you who are fighting the, 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 the dream states of the evening uh, to stay awake. That's our goal. Okay, let's move into uh, one of the things that we're going to invite you to do throughout uh, the hour plus that we have together. And that is to engage in what's called a thinking routine um, called Connect Extend. So as you're taking notes uh, on paper or maybe on a device, pay some particular attention to these two kinds of questions. One is what ideas connect or reaffirm with you know, ideas, strategies, experience you've already had. So we want you to anchor things in the familiar. And then the other question is towards the unfamiliar. What ideas extend your thinking, giving you a new kind of frame or help you to see something in a new way? So connect and extend are two moves uh, we're going to invite you to make. And we'll circle back to the, these uh, at the end of our time together. By the way, feel free to steal this thinking routine. I use it all the time in my classes with my students. It's a very, very handy uh, move to just spark some self-reflection. Okay, let's get into the I-5 framework. Um, we're assuming some of you might have heard a bit about this work, um, but we'd like to just kind of start with a clean slate um, and say a little bit about um, I-5 and where it's coming from and what it's hoping to do. So the framework itself has its roots over many, many decades of research. 
Uh, the framework, as Christian noted in just briefly in his introduction, comes out of a line of research on playful learning. Now, let's pause here for a moment. Playful learning might make sense to you in your cultural context. I mean, maybe there's things around creativity and adaptation and flexibility, and maybe it just gels really nicely with how you think of the experiences in your classroom. Terrific. That said, it may also be met with a lot of skepticism, like playful learning in a business school. Like, really? Isn't playful learning something that, you know, we look at a kindergarten or a toddler center? Well, I've got some news. The news is playful learning is oftentimes related to early childhood education. Those of us who study playful learning, though, try to make a very clear distinction that while there are age limits in their particular kinds of social activities um, in those age brackets, playful learning actually describes a kind of social activity that involves really important elements of human development. So while we might look at young children and say, yes, they're engaged in playful learning, we can look at each one of our practices of how we develop our pedagogy or how we develop expertise. And my bet is that we will find elements of playful learning because playful learning at its core is about empowerment. It's about autonomy. It's about having freedom. It's about having also emotional states like delight and joy, uh, fun. There's also negative states like frustration, um, anxiety, some fear. That's part and parcel of the learning process. What playful learning tries to do is resolve those negative states and positive affective states. So playful learning has a rich kind of set of impacts, if you will, for how we design learning experiences. That work has been championed by a number of foundations and researchers over many, many decades. The Lego Foundation is one of those foundations. The Lego Foundation is separate from the business, let me point out. Um, and they invest globally in understanding how to develop creativity, uh, playfulness, et cetera, in all age groups around the world. Um, the Lego Foundation and the United Nations Prime uh, a few years ago got together with this idea of how we can use and bring to bear some of this powerful research on human development in business classrooms. And this project was born and the I-5 framework emerged and the I-5 framework has its roots in research on playful learning, but it's been culturally adapted to many, many contexts of business schools. This is the partnership with these 18 professors, Natasha and Christian being two of them. And so we've worked over the last few years to understand, well, how does Christian create the conditions for playful learning? How does Natasha do it? What are the kinds of moves and methods? And more importantly, how do these moves and methods meet the goals that Natasha has for her students and Christian has, and that we as professors in the Prime Network have for our students? So this framework has a number of parts, and we're going to walk through them. One is there's a a few anchoring assumptions that professors have when they use this framework. We want to make those explicit because likely this methodology will bump into a number of assumptions we have about our role as teachers, assumptions students have about their role, assumptions we have about, a, say, a curriculum in a, in a university. So there are a lot of assumptions that we need to just name. There are methods. We're going to go through these methods rather briskly, I have to confess. There are many resources we hope you can seek out after this time together. One of them is the playbook. It's been translated in a number of different languages. So more examples, tools, tips, strategies that can be found in the playbook. Um, and the third is signature moves. Each of the method has a subset of moves. Moves are small things we do every day as teachers. So uh, we're going to give you some ideas for moves, but to be absolutely clear, the moves are still being written. I mean, this is not a finished product. Um, while the assumptions and methods are fairly stable, we're imagining that you have moves, you have things you do. And so we want to create a community in which professors can be sharing and iterating on the moves that they make. Okay, that's a quick overview of what we're going to get into. Let's talk about the vision. So this is not going to be news for many of you, but Prime has a, a big remit. And that remit is to create materials, structures, tools for universities and professors 
to better support students development to achieve the sustainable development goals. So that shouldn't be news to any of us. Um, this project fits within that remit. So the vision of this framework is to help us as professors, as part of Prime, create a world where business leaders have holistic skills. Now, why are these important? If we think about the kinds of sustainable development goals, the challenges that we teach about in our classrooms, heck, the challenges we read about in the news every day, these are not simple technical challenges. They require much more than just having some siloed knowledge of a particular kind of practice. Now, these engage, these kinds of challenges demand that leaders engage with uncertainty, systems thinking, complex causality, empathy, cross-cultural learning, et cetera. So there's a whole set of skills that are holistic. They're cognitive, but they're also social and emotional. And so part of the idea of this framework is to create a pedagogy that would create a balanced developmental pathway towards those kinds of holistic skills. And we want to imagine business schools where all subjects and all levels are preparing students with these holistic skills. And the pedagogical approach is called the impactful five. So there are five elements to this framework. And here they are, and we're gonna get into each one in, in a bit. These are called methods. These are born out of the research. And then we did some empirical work with the different professors to kind of get some triangulation on these. Professors in classrooms that are supporting these holistic skills, they make learning meaningful. We'll say more about that, but basically there's purpose behind the kinds of experiences they design. They foster joy in well-being. It's not just an afterthought. It's not something that just happens after class. No, no. We weave in moments of celebration, pride, positive affect. We develop supportive social interactions, a lot of emphasis on empathy and how we can relate with other people across different kinds of differences, facilitate active engagement, and finally designing for iteration. So there are five different kinds of methods. And our goal uh, today, Natasha, or Christian, and myself, is to give you a quick view into these five, hopefully to spark more curiosity and energy if you want to go further. And we'll say more about what that would look like. The framework itself is organized around these five methods, which you can see at the left. And then each of these methods has a number of moves. And again, I'm going to just show you a, a slide that will have a lot of things on it. But don't worry, we're going to we're going to detail each one in the coming time that we have together. Make learning meaningful has a number of moves. I'm not even going to name them, but there are four moves we're going to talk about and invite Natasha and Christian to share some examples of what it looks like in their classroom. Fostering joy and well-being, again, has not four moves there too. Again, there could be five, six, maybe even 15 moves. We don't know, but these are four kind of starter moves that we've learned from the 18 professors. Developing social interactions has a number of moves. Active engagement has a number of moves. And designing for iteration has a number of moves. So just conceptually, so you can get a sense of what we're about to do, we're going to talk about these five, and we're going to talk about each of these related moves over the hour plus that we have together. Okay, let me pause here, see if there's any questions of clarification before we get into some foundational assumptions that undergird this work. Are there any questions of clarification? And I include Natasha and Christian, if I, if I may have missed something that you think would be important to say at the outset. Yeah, just one. Uh, this is uh, Prabhat here hey, Prabhat. from uh, India. Yeah. So uh, one of the prior slide before you introduce, uh, uh, you know, these five, uh, I five or big impact types in detail, uh, because here in you are talking about different moves, etc. Uh, the, there was a, a slide where there were three ideas where you talked about some anchors, moves, was a, probably the last one and something middle. Could you just go back to that slide just for my reference so that in my mind, yeah, anchoring assumption methods and signature moves. So, so when you are talking about these moves of, of I five, you are talking about these signature moves or are these different moves? No, yeah, absolutely correct. Great question, Prabhat. We're talking about the signature moves, and Perfect. there are five methods. So there are five methods, and then so these five methods. methods refer to the I five, right? Correct. You got it. 
This is part, and, part of the decoding right. game. And this uh, uh, anchoring assumption, what do they mean then? Yeah, I'm about to say that. Okay. I'm about to say that. But a good, good question. Thank you for asking that. We don't want to, we don't, we want to be clear, at least at the outset. We'll have lots of room for confusion as we go. Daniel, I just yeah. have a message from Abir asking to let um, her in on her other device, but I think you're the host, so I'm not sure if you can see that someone is trying to come in on. on... I'm going to make I don't you... know if that makes sense to you. Okay, if you uh, make me host, it does well, make sense. I'm going to make you host if that's okay, Natasha. Sure, I'm not I'll have a look. Yeah. The... Okay. One moment. Oh, yeah, I see. Uh, Abir and Paula, thank you. Okay. Okay. Anchoring assumptions. So, as I mentioned, part of the remit of this work is to help professors, ourselves, achieve the kinds of goals that we want to achieve with our students um, and um, within the aegis of the goals of the standard, uh, the sustainable development frameworks of the United Nations. And at the heart here is a concept called responsible leadership. So we're going to be talking about how Natasha and Christian use this method in marketing. Uh, but just for a moment, we want to think more globally about what responsible leadership means. There are a number of veins of research in responsible leadership. Uh, in the playbook, there's lots of resources you can dig in to look at competencies and frameworks of responsible leadership. Um, as we're thinking about responsible leadership, there's two words here. What do we mean by responsible and what do we mean by leadership? We want to just remind ourselves that by leadership, we're not talking about you know, a CEO. We're not talking about a position of power. Uh, we're talking about a complex process of social influence. How is it that we influence not just you know, our students, but we think we influence generations of people as teachers. We're, we're, we're exhibiting leadership. And leadership as it studies is, you know, how we shape the thinking and actions of others towards a particular goal. So as we look at our students, everyone has the potential for leadership. Everyone has the potential, no matter where they fall within an organizational level, to influence the thinking and action of others. And that's an important first assumption. No matter where we are in a hierarchy, uh, we have opportunities uh, to uh, influence one another and display leadership. A second is the SDGs are critical here. I mean, so as we're thinking about responsible leadership, um, responsibility is towards those sustainable development goals. How do we not only honor those as morally important, but pragmatically important? I mean, it's going to be really, really difficult for most of us to survive in economies if we're dealing with you know massive ups and downs of climate change or unpredictability of markets or global warfare and strife i mean these things uh are, again i'm preaching to the choir i'm sure on this zoom call um, but that's a, an important assumption that the sustainable development goals are vital as we think about societal and business success what do we mean by responsibility? Well, the literature has a lot of ideas here, but just to uh, name a, two big areas, responsible leadership uh, is often discussed in terms of different sorts of metacognitive moves, like how self-aware am I of my values, my beliefs? If I'm not aware of those values and beliefs, it's gonna be very, very difficult for me to enter into complex conversations with different stakeholders and look to create and co-create solutions. So self-awareness is, is really important. And ethical attention to others in the world. What, what are my ethical responsibilities here? Like what's going to be, as I think about trade-offs and decisions and choices, or how I interact with different kinds of people in my environment, am I attending ethically to their needs, to my needs, and what will serve our societies in the longer term? A fourth is what I've said already, but just to name it, is that there is a powerful assumption here is that these holistic interdisciplinary and playful skills are really important for long lasting learning. So if we think about transformative forms of learning, 
these kinds of approaches that we're going to discuss, the research is pretty clear that these approaches do support more transformative and lifelong learning skills than most other kinds. We'll say more about that. And lastly, we as educators need to examine our roles. So we don't want to be perpetuating misinformed conceptions of what responsible leadership is. Um, we have a responsibility as educators to really shift the models of how we're engaging our students to facilitate these dynamic learning experiences, uh, not just for fun, although certainly fun is important, but really to help our, to equip our students with the kinds of skills and opportunities that they will face uh, when they're in the real world uh, of work. So those are some big assumptions. Um, just want to make those explicit because these likely, I mean, they may bump up against cultural assumptions in your institution. They may bump up against some beliefs that you carry as well. So naming these, I think, is, opens up some possibilities for a good conversation and good learning, not just in the hour that we have, but hopefully long term. Okay, let's get into the framework. So the framework has five different methods. We're going to talk about each method uh, briefly. Um, and as we talk about the methods, I just want to remind you of the connect extend, extend thinking routine. You know, what's connecting for you here? Something that connects to something you already do. What's extending your thinking maybe in some new ways? So make those notes as we go forward. Now, there's no particular order to these methods. We're just going to start. So as we're thinking about how do we design learning experiences, you know, some of us may or may not have taken a course on pedagogy and curriculum development. Um, if you have, you'll, you'll see lots of good resonance. If you haven't, treat this hour as your pedagogy 101 skills course. <laughs> we're gonna, there's like a boot camp here for you to think about your teaching and your curriculum development. Move number one, again, in no particular order, is making learning meaningful. Now, look, maybe this seems obvious, but I can tell you, as someone who's taught for many, many years, uh, like many of you, I'm sure, there are things that I have to teach that, frankly, many students don't find meaningful. And it's my job to try to figure out, are there any hooks? Are there ways I can tweak a topic, an idea, a strategy, a concept. So it actually has some meaning. Now, meaning can mean lots of different things. Um, but at its core, what we found in the work with professors uh, at Prime, it's about honoring and emphasizing the existing knowledge and experiences of my students. So there's different ways that I need to understand what they know, what they're interested in what their experiences are. Many of us may teach students from lots of different cultural contexts. And so asking questions, being curious, really understanding their values is critical here to making learning meaningful. Also making learning meaningful is about provoking students, learners, to critically reflect on relevant topics. So Many of our students are being inundated with lots of information in media, lots of experience in their local communities. Our classes are moments where we can bring those topics right to the foreground, like what's happening in their worlds, and really give them some practice about how to critically reflect on those topics using course concepts. So that's the idea of making learning meaningful. There's a number of moves, and I'm just going to say something very, very briefly about each of these moves, hoping that it might spark some connections and extensions, and then invite Natasha and Christian to share a little bit about what this method and moves look like in their classrooms of marketing. One move is role modeling. We should be exemplifying and embodying meaning making for our students. Basically, opening up windows where students can see what's meaningful to us. Why? What kinds of ideas have resonance for us as human beings, as professors? What really excites us? What frustrates us? What are the kinds of beliefs that we have about topics? That's important role modeling. 
Another move is personalizing. Personalizing is, yeah, how do we understand each of our students? Some of our classes may be very, very large. I teach a class of about 80 students. Uh, that's my largest class. There are others who may on this call who might teach hundreds of students. It's really hard to personalize in large scale. Well, I have TFs. I have different kinds of uh, resources in which I can help TFs or which are teaching assistants, teaching fellows, graduate students who help with my teaching, you know, help them understand my students. Uh, but also there's lots of things I can do. Like before classes, I could ask students to fill out a survey, tell me about their interests, et cetera. So there's ways to personalize experiences. Surfacing is another move. Surfacing is about how, when we enter into topics, we allow and provoke some kind of critical reflection on assumptions students are bringing. So surfacing is to create moments where their ideas, conceptions, beliefs, theories can rise to the top. They can make them explicit for themselves and we as a community can make them explicit for others. Now, look, I can tell you that one of the frightening parts of surfacing is that what happens if they surface things that are really wrong? Well, you know what? It's better to surface them now in your class than five years down the road when they're in a business. So take that fear on. Um, we are creating developmental spaces with our students. So better to surface now. And finally, dignifying. Dignifying is honoring the different kinds of cultural differences, diversities, values, beliefs, indigenous ways of knowing, all of these different kinds of values, cultural kinds of capital that our students bring in. We need to know that, you know, when we create classrooms, we're going to have lots of different kinds of fears that our students have about their own identities and will they be accepted and honored in our classrooms. And I'd like the answer to be yes, that we will be accepting and honoring of all the different kinds of identities and structures in our classrooms. That's dignifying. How do we do that? That is a move uh, that many of the professors make. So making learning meaningful, kind of obvious. We want to have that meaning making. So people have that personal connection, feel motivated. Lots of moves are at our disposal around role modeling and personalizing surfacing and dignifying among many others. So at this point, I just want to uh, turn it over to um, our two uh, guests um, to share a little bit. I think this is from Christian. Christian, is this yours? Yeah. So Christian, what is this and how does this, how does this kind of evoke, make learning meaningful in your class? Uh, thanks, Daniel. And uh you know, there were, this was a hard one to pick pick one of the examples because there's a few things that you've just described to the group around, you know, uh, dignifying. We do a lot of work with Indigenous uh, communities here, and then we bring that into the classroom. Um, we do a lot of work. Uh, I do a lot of work in those marketing classes around interest surveys and really picking brands and examples that the students can uh, it resonates with them. But I chose this one because it's simple. And as a marketing professor, and this is specifically for my business minor students. So I want you to picture they're coming from all over the university and business is not their major. It's, you know, it's anything from humanities to uh, sciences and math. So they're coming in and they're just learning the basics about business in a marketing course. And so this, what you're looking at is a bee house. And it's something that uh, it's important to me to look at nature and, um, you know, promote bee populations, because I think we all understand how bee populations are critical to our ecosystems. And we've been, uh, that's been kind of a, a challenging area for us uh, currently. So I have many choices of examples I can bring in for the students and what they would work on in a class and the, an activity in class to help them understand the concepts of product and how to reach certain types of customers. So I'm doing the, you know, the classic segmentation and product features, product uh, branding, etc. This one I brought in, and it's not because solely because I, I, I'm passionate about it, but I thought if I can get those students excited or help excite them around, if we're going to deal with products and we're going to deal with those elements of marketing, let's look at something that really uh, has a positive impact in society. Mm -hmm. So where it's meaningful is, um, and it speaks to some of these signature moves, to bring that piece in, it's boxed, I let them unbox it, I let them touch it and feel it, 
and really study it and then you know go out and do a bit of research on what would be the type of customer that really would grab onto this and really find meaning in it. So mm -hmm. it kind of takes the role modeling signature move of your professor, which they see as, I don't know, I guess successful or a leader at the front of the classroom, is passionate about this and is bringing in, introducing it into the classroom. And they seem to really enjoy uh, using that as an activity. What a beautiful example. Yeah. And I see that it's like role modeling. I mean, and it's, and it's, you know, the, the, we each have hobbies or interests. So that's a great place to start. Like what interests you? And then how can you bring that in? And that's going to, uh, to the role modeling, I mean, that that will carry forward. And, you know, I can tell you too, it's like, Christian, I'm sure you've experimented with things that maybe didn't work as well. well <laughs> but yes. yes, part of it is just, you try things out. Um, and, but starting from what's interesting to you, I think is really intriguing. Natasha, you have an example too, right? Uh, yeah. So what is this and what, what are the connections you make to the meaningful? Okay. So this um, is really relates to authentic assessment. And this is about trying to make assessment tasks meaningful for students. So this is an exercise I developed for a new module I wrote, which is called Sustainable Luxury. So in this module, we're exploring all sorts of different aspects of, of what luxury means and what sustainability can be. And, you know, that can end up being, you know, is complex, there's a lot going on. And But in terms of an assignment, I didn't want students just to, just to write an essay or to do a quiz. I wanted them to really... Um, surface something that had meaning for themselves and that they would take forward in their careers. So I always think about our students as being young professionals. They don't always understand that they have agency, but they will have agency. And it's, you know, at some point that probably develops and they'll have more. But I want them to understand where they can bring their influence. So each October, my students take part in, in World Values Day and I ask them, it's a really lovely exercise, it's mentioned in the playbook, um, and it's really just a, a card sort exercise where you surface values that are important to you. So what could be more kind of personal for that? But then I've re we return to that later in the term when students are asked to create a manifesto for the change that they want to see in the area of luxury. And so this is from one of my students a couple of years ago now, who really got interested in the concept of women as leaders in sustainability. It was around the time of the COP26 that was in Glasgow. There was an article out there talking about the lack of women's leadership within sustainability. And it's a topic that really obviously resonated with her. And the students create a video manifesto. They support that with some writing. They hook it onto one of the SDGs. So this is SDG five for gender equality. Um, and I think, you know, it's interesting what you were saying about not, not be careful of what you surface, but be aware of what you surface, because this is an example that I feel comfortable sharing. There's a, the video is on our public um, site, but sometimes the students surface things around, uh, you know, discrimination and inequalities that they have suffered personally and those and they can make some really powerful um, content, but that isn't something that I would feel comfortable sharing publicly. So I think, again, in, mm -hmm. in our role in the classroom, it's important, you know, in this idea of honouring um, and respecting that that we kind of are, are managers of that as a, as a safe space. Thank you, Natasha. And, and, and notice some of the different scales here of the examples. I mean, Kristen, the object, you can kind of like anchor the object. And then out of that object, you can kind of like think about the content and the process. And Natasha's talking about kind of a, there's a project here where people are pitching and creating these things. So there's some different scales of time with these moves, but hopefully it gives you an example, um, at least from two different cultural contexts of, of what make learning meaningful looks like. Hey, just a reminder, if you have questions, uh, put them in the chat as we go. Um, and also make notes to yourself, what's connecting and what's extending, what's kind of, what feels familiar, connects to what you already do and what's, you know, what's a little bit new, pushing your thinking in a new way. Okay, that's one method make learning meaningful. Let's talk about another method. The inspiration behind this second method. Uh, here's a quote from beautiful, um, powerful educational philosopher named Paulo Freire, which some of you might know, but he has this lovely quote. The task of the teacher, who is also a learner, is both joyful and rigorous. It demands seriousness and scientific 
physical, emotional, and affective preparation. We must dare so as never to dichotomize cognition and emotion. So for those of us in educational circles, this is a fairly important quote. I mean, Freire is an important philosopher who really was talking about radically uh, reconceptualizing what education should be um, and also pointing out the role that holistic skills have in uh, what it means to be human. So we must never dichotomize cognition and emotion is something that, you know, particularly say in neuroscience over the last 20 years, it's been clear. I mean, emotions have their basis in cognitive processes and activities. While we can talk about them as shorthand, as separate kinds of things, they're actually intertwined. So um, for they have some inspiration for this method, which we call foster joy and well-being. Probably all can remember experiences in universities that were not joyful, and we were not we were not taking good care of ourselves, uh, pulling all nighters. Maybe we had a professor that was humiliating us. I'm sorry. This, suddenly, this is going to turn into a therapy session. So, uh, never mind. Let's not go down that path. Um, but joy and well-being are. We know we need to. I want to make a, a really important point that we're as humans. As we are learning, we're going to have a range of emotional uh, experiences. Um, if we're not having emotional experiences, we should question the quality of learning, uh, frankly. Um, emotion, for example, is tied to long-term memory. <laughs> I mean, good or bad emotions. I mean, so the emotions have, are a potent ally in learning. And so designing powerful and deep learning experiences should take into account how we build in opportunities to infuse and celebrate those positive affective as well as negative affective states, but we want to call them joy and well-being. Well-being is not just being happy. It's about being resilient in the face of challenges. So we're talking about holistic wellness through creating joyful experiences and supporting emotional, mental, and spiritual fulfillment for ourselves and for our students. You know, oftentimes we might have some micro moments in our classrooms where there's suddenly a burst of joy and celebration. Beautiful. Let's do more of that. There might be some other moments of depression and fear, sadness. Absolutely. That, and that will be part of the learning process. It's how do we braid the two together so that when we experience negative feelings, we can resolve them through some kind of positive affect, celebration, pride, satisfaction, solidarity. I mean, these are ways that we can resolve negative states. There's a number of moves we've tracked in professors uh, throughout classrooms. Here are four. One is delighting. Well, delighting is just creating those moments where we can feel delighted, surprised, uh, a sense of awe. Um, for example, in that image that Christian said, uh, shared, you know, the birdhouse with, that's delightful. <laughs> I mean, it has elements of delight just there. We can touch it. We can engage in it. There, I'm not saying we're going to run down the streets, you know, whooping and laughing, but there's something novel about it. Well, that's delighting. Sensing is another. How do we open our, our various senses up to the world as it is being, you know, as it's inviting us <laughs> to experience it? So it's not just the written word or the spoken word, but how do we use our bodies? How do we touch? How do we taste? How do we feel ourselves moving? So as humans, we have a range of senses. And we shouldn't limit ourselves to just a few, particularly if we're engaging in holistic, emotional kinds of skill development. So sensing is about creating those moments where we can feel in all the ways we feel. Uh, an experience. And that may be not verbal and not written. That's sensing. 
contemplating. It, it's exactly what the word sounds like. <laughs> How do we create opportunities for pausing, slowing down, and thinking about our experience? And that's contemplating. Look, life is so busy. I can't even pretend to know all the things each of you are juggling in your lives. Contemplation is hard to find. But that doesn't mean when we create classrooms that we should not try to create the conditions and moves we think are going to be best, not just for our students, but for society. So creating moments of contemplation, small, large, whatever it might be, could be moments of silence. It could be moments of you know, meditation. It could be journal writing, whatever it might be. And finally, rippling. And rippling is about how we understand how our behaviors affect others. So it's about the rippling out of influence. So if I make this choice, how will it impact you, my colleague? How will it impact the family down the street? How will it impact the community outside my community? So it's about understanding the rippling nature of how we influence one another. Fostering joy and well-being. Now, again, this is about positive affective states, but it's really about emotional resilience too. We can do this through delighting, sensing, contemplating, rippling, and other kinds of moves in classrooms. Natasha, I'm curious what it might look like in your class, this foster joy and well-being. What are the moves you make? And we have some images here. Maybe you can unpack. Absolutely. So first of all, I have to say, if people aren't aware, Christine and I are the joy twins. <laughs> so you're lucky you've not only got us as the marketing gurus, but we are the joy twins. And I have to say, as I talk about this, the I-5 has been a space where I have found lots of joy. And I think it's so important that we have joy in our own classrooms because we have a tough job to do. So Although we're very student focused, I think when we can find these spaces where we have joy together, then that's great. So people on the call may have heard this already. So apologies. Um, but this really, this, this is a kind of instance, I guess, explaining a little bit how Daniel and Amber worked from Harvard Graduate School of Education talking to us. So as professors, we shared experiences and they kind of looked at them through the I-5 lens and really kind of, I suppose, talked them back to us in the I-5 way. So this is um, something that happened to me when I was invited to teach a week's responsible business um, a summer school. And I was at a, in Toulouse Business School. My discipline is fashion, but these were business students, not fashion students. And I was using case studies to teach um, around sustainable and responsible business. And one of the sessions I was talking about textile waste. And I happened to, well, I, we know that um, a truck full of textiles goes into landfill every minute um, and we have such a big problem in the world with irresponsible consumption and overproduction so I was explaining how quite often things get thrown away because a zip breaks or a button falls off and I just uh, and I said when people don't know how to sew a button on and I asked the class do you know how to sew on a button and from this lovely group because this is the actual group uh, only three of them did so it just occurred to me in that moment that I could again I, uh, assessment <laughs> In your assessment at the end of this week, by the end of this week, everyone is going to have to know how to sew on a button. And then it also brought some joy for me because I had to explore Toulouse and find a haberdashers and buy felt and buy buttons and get scissors. And there's, there's an example of a button floating in front of me. And we all sat and did this physical activity. And I did say to the students, this is the most valuable lesson that you will get in your um, business school education. And I just have a little postscript because I have now used this example. I've used it in staff development. I've used it in you know, different classes in different ways. And with my students recently, we were doing this exercise, but I also added another element of surprise, which was bringing in the story of the tailor of Gloucester. So I'm a massive fan of Beatrix Potter. Sorry, I know the video screen's not working terribly well there. And I, it occurred to me that the story of the little mice who rescue the scraps from the tailor um, and make clothes for themselves, which is what Beatrix Potter um, did in that story. The, the situation of the tailor being impoverished, making these beautiful clothes that very rich people were wearing, and yet he was living an impoverished life, also was a really good parallel with what goes on in the world of fashion and luxury today. So I then showed the students a little clip 
of that Beatrix Potter um, video as well. So it's kind of this little example of rippling is rippling even further. Beautiful. And what a great, you know, illustrating, you know, not just rippling, but also this idea of sensing and delighting. And it's, you know, there's there are so many everyday objects, right, Natasha, that we can look around like you just happen to stumble on buttons <laughs> and it's like, wow, there's an opportunity. So, you know, it, it is re it's a good reminder that um, paying attention to what excites us and the kinds of things that we think would be interesting, it gives us good fuel for creating joy and well-being. Christian, what does joy and well-being look like in your clo? Look like in your classroom? <laughs> yeah, and I'm so glad Natasha uh, mentioned that we're the joyful twins because I think that is just something that um, for not everyone, but for us, it just seems like it's innate in us. Like we just naturally bring that into our classroom. So would appreciate, you know, in this population, that might be something that you want to extend or think about. And I, I worry sometimes that. Uh, when people hear the words joy and well-being, they might think it's too playful. So, but yet, um, as I'm working with the community of practice, I'm seeing, I'm getting feedback in my part of the world that this is something that we want to pay more attention to because, as Daniel mentioned, it's not just the positive feelings; it's addressing and dealing with those anxious emotions that some of our students have with anxiety. So, what you're looking at here is. Uh, my fourth year Bachelor of Commerce students, I teach in our specialization called service management. And so they're really becoming service specialists, going to work in service oriented organizations. The specific course that I teach is customer experience management. So, you know, how do we map it out? How do we make sure that the customer's needs are taken care of and design and strategize around customer experience? This, the first two top photos that you're looking at, the session that day was conflict resolution or service failure and, and service recovery, which when you get into the role plays, I give them scenarios that can be quite, um, they're gonna be in role plays and it's gonna be uh, not comfortable. We tend to be conflict averse here in Canada. So in preparation for that, before I put them into these role plays where it would be kind of negative emotions they have to deal with, and they're gonna have to deal with this as leaders in the workplace with their staff and their customers, as we start the class, put them in new teams. Head over a five minute walk to our gardens, beautiful Finnerty Gardens here at the campus. Just want you to spend a couple of minutes over there, take a group photo, you and your teams, and then just you know upload it to our learning management system, come back and then I'll give you the details about how we're gonna work through the material. And so here, some of them get really into it. I don't know how to do a handstand, but apparently one of our students got really into this. So really, really positive emotions in preparation for, and I didn't tell them this is why they're doing it, as they come back and have to work through these really you know, uncomfortable scenarios, really difficult, upset, raging customers. So it was attempting to, as we debriefed in the class at the very end, why did we do that exercise? Because it's important for us as leaders to prepare and make sure we have joyful moments in our workplaces, in our classrooms, to open up our minds, trigger that part of the brain that, you know, is creative solutions, problem solving, innovation type of thinking. And that fueled them and prepared them well for those challenging um, leadership and things that they'd have to do. Just underneath that, that's an MBA class and highlighting that as an example, folks, because as Daniel said earlier, this applies in all levels. Some of us might be worried at the graduate level that anything around joy might be not well received uh, by our graduate, serious graduate MBA students. But here's an example of us just having a little bit of fun during a case study. These are, you can't see them, but they're breathe right strips. See, we're actually wearing the product that we're studying around. Uh, it helps with nasal congestion, et cetera. And it is the last class. So after we've done all our hard work, we are taking a moment to remember those, um, that kind of joyful being together, wearing wearing these nasal strips on our face. <laughs> there it is. Oh, thank you. and and. And I, I love that you're uh, noting that even small things like take a picture of your team. I mean, that creates a sense of pride and social connection. So that's there's small moves here uh, that we can make, not just big ones, but you know, there's small little micro moves we can make. 
Thank you. Uh, let me also note that Magdalena has put a question in chat and uh, Natasha has already responded, but let's open this up for others too. If you want to respond in chat, uh, Magdalena is wondering if if we have some uh, sources, good sources for case studies for business students. So we probably, some of you might have some ideas that we could share with Magdalena in the chat. So thank you, Magdalena, for asking, asking that. Um, okay, make learning meaningful, foster joy and well-being. We're going to breeze through these next three rather quickly, uh, just to uh, keep up uh, the pace going. Um, again, reminder, note connections and extensions as we go. Third method, develop supportive social interaction. So we want to create, if, we, if we're going to have these conversations, or let's say Natasha was saying, maybe difficult conversations, conversations where there are topics and things going on in the world that are really hard and challenging, we have to be careful to create the conditions for supportive social interactions uh, where people can feel uncomfortable, but safe. Um, creating a community in which students can observe, listen, dialogue, dialogue meaning the co-construction and sharing of meaning and effectively communicate with others from different, with different perspectives, practices and cultures. So um, this can be tricky. I mean, it really can be. I mean, I teach like you probably lots of different kinds of cultural uh, contexts. And so uh, we don't always know for certain what will be the topics or ideas that will be triggering. And so creating those conditions from the outset early on um, is critical. Look, nobody's perfect on this. Let's also give ourselves some grace uh, that this this is part of, I think, the art of being a good pedagogue. There's some moves we can make. One is communifying. I mean, how do we in fact set the norms, set the kinds of values, goals in which we come together as a community? In large groups, that's really hard, but you know, there's different ways we can do that, communifying. I mean, here's a small thing I do in my classroom, uh, particularly in the large groups. I don't call on students. I have them call on each other. And what that does is if a student puts up their hand in the air, uh, you know, another student who just is speaking has to see that hand and then call on them. So rather than having all of the gay eye contact going to me in, my, in the classroom, students are looking at each other <laughs> as they're talking in class because they need to see where the next hand goes up. And then they can choose, okay, where how the conversation's moving around. If I have to speak, I have to put my hand up and they have to call on me. And let me tell you, there's some fun moments where they don't call on me in class. <laughs> anyway, that's a small move around communifying, basically creating the community container. Braving is another one. This is where role modeling is very helpful. Creating the conditions where we can take safe risks. We can step into a space and be courageous. And oftentimes, allow others to forgive us if we make mistakes. So braving is about creating that mutually brave space where we have forgiveness, we can be with each other in a developmental way. And that's what being brave is, being that courageous to step in there. And that is a hard space to hold, not only for our students, but let's first start with ourselves. Bridging is another move. Bridging is how we make the connections among our students, you know, could be among their interests, maybe their, maybe some of their experiences they're bringing in, but also bridging to the local communities. So who are the businesses, the leaders, the other people in our community that we can create connections with? Classrooms are a place and a space, but the kinds of things we're preparing students to do are not going to be in a classroom. <laughs> they're going to be out in the world. So how can we bring the classroom to the world and the world to our classroom more regularly? That's what bridging is about. And finally, teaming. Teaming is creating those you know, group projects, those moments where students can come together, do collaborative work, but more importantly, support each other as they are learning. So teaming is about the interdependence uh, among folks in a group to accomplish a particular goal. There's lots of ways that we can do this, um, creating norms, creating different kinds of vision statements um, with our students. So those are four moves around 
developing supportive social interactions. Um, Christian, do you want to give a quick example of how you do this, a move you make in your classroom? Sure, absolutely, yeah. Fairly briefly, so some of you may do this, but I created what's called a team charter. Sometimes I'll call them team contracts. For many of us in business schools, we get our, our students to work together to create group projects. There is you know, some anxiety around that. There's some challenges around group grades, et cetera. So this team charter provides the students as they form teams to work together. So before they start working on the project for grades, this template that I provide for them provides this guided coaching uh, basically conversation that they probably wouldn't have on their own. So it starts off really basic. Let's choose a name for us and what are some goals that we want to achieve in this? What are some of the skills that we have? So it's really kind of the easier, tangible kinds of things they can talk about and you know build a mini relationship. But as they move through this team charter, now we're starting to talk about, you know, what are some really important values that each one of us want to bring into the project? How do we want to be together? Social norms. What are agreed upon behaviors to show respect, et cetera? And then it even, you know, toward the end of it, if these agreements aren't being honored, what, what do we do about that? So again, wouldn't expect my students to normally have those conversations. It nudges them ever so gently to have those conversations at the very beginning before they engage in, you know, the research and the strategy, et cetera when it's probably a little bit too late to maybe understand that behavior and process is just as important as getting the tasks done. They sign this, they submit it. I give a, them a copy back so they can refer to that as they move through the various stages of group development. Thank you, Christian. And yeah, some of you, some folks, as you said, they might also do something like this, but really, really important about how do we get the create the tools and the processes to get these conditions in place so we hope the teams will be as effective as possible. Uh, Natasha, what does this social support of social interaction look like in your class? Yeah, so this is a project that went on for several years in my previous role, and it was really a way of internationalizing at home because we all know that students benefit from exposure to other cultures, but we can't always travel. And we also know, especially in places like London, we're welcoming students from many parts of the world into our classrooms but not always welcoming that, them that well. So in my doctorate, I really focused on intercultural education. Um, and individually, I've had experiences of living and working in different places around the world. So this sort of the idea of working together, understanding that things can be culturally situated, thinking about different expectations for a classroom, but also because we're talking about marketing today, thinking about when businesses are working internationally, that they are not working in exploitative ways and that they are not engaging in cultural appropriation. So this was a project where we brought students from Hong Kong, Vietnam, Singapore and London together. We created a Facebook, um, a private Facebook group where they could engage in uh, similar exercises around marketing and the project that they all had was to either bring a British brand into their market or if or to vice versa so it was really students could choose to to work with um, a culture and a, a business that they were familiar with or to go into an area that they weren't familiar with and it was um, similar to you saying how you get your students to call on each other it was peer-to-peer and because it was Facebook, and this is a while ago now, Facebook was probably a, possibly a safer space. They also could communicate in Facebook chat with emojis. They could look at each other's mood boards and design ideas and concepts and just give each other kind of support in that way. But it also really, I think, helped them understand how they had cultural capital. So mm -hmm. if I have a student from Hong Kong in my classroom in London, suddenly, oh, I'm the master of this. I under, you know, I understand and I can inform people about this. It was really... You know, from my perspective, I was trying to tackle a lot of different aspects, but from the student's perspective, it kind of maybe just appeared like a regular fashion marketing project. Mm. And I know we're all familiar with being in the online space now, but, you know, those opportunities weren't so um, well afforded in the past. And I found this a really effective way. A beautiful illustration of that linking idea. Like, how do we connect and make those bridges out to uh, other learners, but also to be thinking about other cult cultural implications for the work that we do. Thank you. Um, okay, folks, we've done three of the, of the methods. We just have two more to go. Um, 
let's talk about facilitate active engagement now. Now, now this hopefully feels kind of obvious, um, but we need to be doing things. Uh, learning is not a passive uh, uh, enterprise. Now, I, I say that full well recognizing that there are a lot of passive practices that we have inherited um, as professors. I mean, schooling in its history has not been generally the most active area of engagement for learners. So there's a lot of progress, but there's still we have still far to go, I think. So attending active engagement in these classrooms, we're looking at creating the conditions where they can be motivated, our learners can be motivated, but they're engaging in something into which they're personally invested um, and they're really kind of committed to that. Uh, so there's different kinds of moves we can make with active engagement. I mean, one is just animating. I mean, Christian had his students go outside. He animated them. <laughs> he got them to move physically. Physical movement is, you know, I think often overlooked as a really interesting pedagogical move <laughs> we can make. Just getting up, stretching, walking around, finding someone you don't know, taking a little walk. This is all ways of animating uh, in which uh, we hope will lead to the kind of active engagement. Authenticating is another move. We're looking for real authentic challenges in our community. What are those things? What are the mean? I mean, we talked about meaningful uh, earlier as a move. Active engagement means we're actually digging into these things that are meaningful. So uh, we're not just reading about them. No, we're going to do some site visits. We're actually going to interview people. We're actually going to prototype some things, whatever it might be. But we're actually doing something that's authentic, both to our goals, our community, the kinds of communities we hope to serve. Linking. Oh, I think I said linking in the last one. But anyway, linking is, um, Natasha, I think, had a great example of that. I mean, we're basically making the personal relationships here. We're facilitating active engagement through constructing new relationship networks. So linking is, do we bring guests in? Do we bring leaders in? Do we go meet leaders? Do we go out into the community? We're creating the links um, so that these relational, or rather the relationships, hopefully can create new ways that we're sharing information but probably more importantly, new ways that we can create new solutions to the kinds of problems that we're facing in the world. And lastly, facilitating active engagement in today's world means we're, we're going to be in digital platforms. We're going to be using things like Zoom. We're going to be using you know, social media. We're going to be using decision-making software. We're going to be using AI. So all of these technological um, areas, uh, we should be facilitating active engagement in um, what that looks like, well, it's going to depend a lot on, you know, your your level of comfort, your expertise, the kinds of tools that marketers use. But whatever we decide we're going to bring into our classrooms, they should be the kinds of tools that marketers use, people use in the business world. And so it's not just, you know, creating healthy habits around technology, but creating healthy and effective habits with the technologies that will best equip them to be responsible leaders. So facilitative active engagement, a number of moves. I profess, I'm not sure which one of you has this image. Can you guess? It's me. <laughs> <laughs> Natasha, what are we looking at? So this was an event that um, I organized shortly after joining the British School of Fashion. And it was a way of working with industry, but not just having a guest speaker or not just having a panel. We organized an industry think tank. So we hosted with the British Beauty Council an industry think tank on the topic, is beauty inclusive? Mm -hmm. And we had our MBA and our postgraduate marketing students. We had alumni and we had um, emerging leaders in industry, so some younger professionals and then more established professionals. And we had a whole evening and a series of activities. So it was a closed kind of um, mm. industry think tank. And from that, a report came. So it was really getting the students to engage directly with industry and also getting them to practice and rehearse being in that professional space and seeing mm. how, the, how professionals engage in a meeting format, not just as a panelist. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, 
you can hopefully people can see that kind of linking and 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 it's like an authentic this is a real challenge that's facing the industries christian what does active engagement look like in your classroom uh, yeah so this what the, the image that you're looking at right now is a, a field trip and it's we're visiting a, a really sustainable operation it's a coffee uh, coffee producer or coffee roasting and uh, a seller to retailers of coffee um so this is a field trip and this again is those fourth year service management students and um, forgot to mention the course is services marketing uh, also called customer experience so we're taking them out and we are getting them to uh, experience and learn from the leaders in sustainability and production and customer experience and operations so, um what i wanted to highlight here is how i get value if, if you have thought about you know animating getting them to move around go meet link with industry the real value I'm focusing on now is the work we do before the field trip, really get them to study and understand the strategy behind what these companies are trying to do, experience it, time to ask questions. And then after I'm really spending time now, robust, comprehensive, deep debriefs on mm. what did you learn? What, you know, what concepts in the classroom are similar or different connections or extensions from what you've heard from those leaders that practice in industry. And so spending, you know, like one or two classes after the field trip to really link back all of the uh, learnings and understandings. And this just happens to be a leader in our community who's really happy to work with our students and provide such value. So I think the students get, get so much value out of, of doing that and being in the field and hearing more than just my voice about responsible marketing means this. They hear it from those that are doing it. Oh, beautiful examples from both of you. Thank you. And it, and a good reminder that, you know, field trips are a good place to start. <laughs> but to your point, you know, it, just because we go somewhere doesn't mean we're actively engaged. <laughs> and so the pre and the post work that you did around that, it's like, how do we create the conditions so that when we go there, we're going to be actively engaging. It's not just like, okay, we're going to, we're not just going to visit. No, that actually there's some deeper purposes and processes that we'll engage in during the visit. So kudos. Yeah. And they actually present back their information. So we work together, but there's a real deliverable on this. So they are, you know, the teams are up pre presenting back to the class their key learning. So they are, they should be invested in, in that learning. Yeah. Okay. Last uh, last method for those of you playing along at home, uh, we've hit four. This is number five, um, design for iteration. Well, look, learning is an iterative process. I mean, it doesn't happen just like that. Uh, learning requires cycles of doing and feedback, uh, input, experimenting. I mean, there are processes that happen over time. And that are iterative. Uh, designing for iteration basically honors those feedback and action steps. So kind of like what Christian was saying, it's like, it's not just about doing something. Iterating means we're going to try something. We're going to prep for it. We're going to do a little bit. We're going to take stock. We're going to try it again. We're going to do a little bit more. So it has more of like cycle feel, not just like a straight line experience. We're creating performances. These are things that students are doing to show uh, what they're learning and they're thinking and feedback. So feedback fuels the learning process, uh, creating opportunities where they're taking risks, experimenting, learning from mistakes, et cetera. Iteration can happen in lots of different ways. So the moves that we saw in many of the classrooms, I don't think are going to be all that uh, unfamiliar to you, but here's some. One is just exploring. What is exploring? It's exactly what it sounds like. We're basically, we're, there's a topic or an object or a question or something that invites us to think, think it through, to just create theories, to kind of open-endedly explore the possibilities. Now, exploring can often happen at the beginning of a subject. What was that question, Natasha, that you said that was, uh, is beauty inclusive? Inclusive. Oh, what a great, beautiful question. We can imagine that as a provocation. 
I mean, it like provokes us to explore. That's what exploring is kind of like mucking about, if you will. Another move is prototyping. This is straight out of design thinking uh, for some of you who may be already doing prototyping. It is that's it's about ideating. It's about, you know, creating different kinds of very loose drafts, could be ideas, could be products, could be services, whatever it is. Uh, but there's a process. You create something, you get some feedback, you test, you try it again, you iterate through the process. Several different models for that. Some of you might be using some of that uh, already in your classroom. Last two are revisiting encompassing. And I have to say that I've saved these last two for last because I think they're so interesting. What is revisiting? Revisiting is a move we see in classrooms in which we invite learners to go back to their previous ideas. One of the interesting insights around human motivation is that one thing that motivates us is when we can see progress. Revisiting is about seeing the progress. So maybe we ask our students to, you know, write a reflection at the first week of class. Well, maybe in the middle of the semester, we have them go back to that reflection and notice how their thinking has changed. That's revisiting. Maybe some of you use e-portfolios or por portfolios where students pick pieces of work over time that showcase their development. That's revisiting. We're going back to where we were and looking at that moment through the lens of where we are now, the shifts of our thinking and our progress. And that relates to compassing. And this is the final move. Compassing is about how do we give our students the tools where they can gauge their direction? That is, they themselves have compasses to guide their learning. Compasses as a metaphor can include things like rubrics, checklists, criteria, guidelines. These are tools we offer our students so they are then empowered and self-directed to iterate and adjust their experience. So if they look at, say, a draft of something they're writing and there's a checklist, they can use that checklist to basically iterate themselves, give themselves feedback to improve their thinking, their learning, and their deliverables. So iteration is about these processes. And just quickly, I wonder if we might get some quick examples. Uh, is this Christian? It is. And what you're looking at here, uh, folks, is one of four small uh, in-class activities that I provide to our uh, second year marketing students. And it's a way, it kind of fits with compassing. It kind of is that section here that talks about decentering grading a little bit. They'll have a big final exam, they have midterms, they have all those real formal assessment pieces, but intertwined with that are these really uh, easy, uh, they get small, um, little bits of points, maybe two and a half to three percentage points for each one of these four in-class exercises. But this one was literally a brainstorming exercise using Play-Doh and expanding beyond the typical markets using children as the market and other ways to use Play-Doh. And that allows this risk-taking, it just allows them to be playful and think and just explore. There aren't any right or wrong answers. In fact, they get full marks just for showing me that they've had conversations, they've thought about it, and they've applied to some degree the marketing concepts that we're covering in that time of the course. And these four little exercises are spread out over the term. Uh, the buy into this and the excitement that is brought into the classroom by these simple exercises simply because it took away maybe some of the pressures of the formal assessments and it prepares them i think a little bit better for those formal assessments like the final exam because i'll put questions on uh, related to their exercises really good point iteration really does point as christian's saying it's like it's pointing us to the the formative process not just the end the end product it's about how do we how do we get that kind of um, feedback to ourselves and to others? Natasha, what does it look like in your classroom? 
Yeah, so my example is a thought protocol that comes from Howard Gardner, so it comes from Project Zero, and I use this in lots of different ways. And so the first time I used it was in a marketing strategy class, and it was particularly applied to ideas around sustainable marketing and responsible business, actually. So I asked students to reflect back, to engage in some metacognition, and you use these STEM, sentence STEMs, to get students to reflect. So I find reflection very useful, but it's also quite hard for people to engage in. And it's just, I used to think, and now I think. So you can give the students a topic to do that about. So I used to, you know, previously about sustainable marketing, I used to think, and now I think. And it was a really good way of unpacking people's um, assumptions and letting them think about the progress that they'd made or how their ideas had changed. And I also, just not to take too much time, but I also have just used this in a midterm kind of reflective piece on how we're doing so you know at the beginning of this term what I thought this module would be and now I think this so it, it's a really I find this really flexible and a really great way to just uncover and unpack some reflection thank you Natasha and Christian for all of these examples I mean it's hopefully again the the idea is that there's some things that would connect and resonate and hopefully there's some things that would extend your thinking in new ways okay to recap folks all right the goal was to give you an overview of the, of the I-5 framework. We've done that. We have these five methods to the left. And to the right, we have these different kinds of moves. Now, as we said, th there is a playbook. It's online. You can Google it. Um, I don't know if Natasha or Christian, you might have a low oh, there. You have a copy right there. Okay. <laughs> you can find it. There's a lot more information and resources if you want to go deeper. But the goal of this is to give you a taste a sense of the different kinds of uh, ideas that are emerging thus far from the work. And we want to um, end with uh, reflections. Um, so if folks feel like you have a connection or extension, you'd like to uh, verbalize uh, or put in chat. Uh, we'd love to hear some voices. Um, so let's see if there's a, someone maybe one voice and other, other folks can link, uh, sorry, can put, extensions and connections in the chat. Is there someone who'd like to share something that really resonated with them? Magdalena? Yeah, I would like to share. Maybe you hear some baby voices in the background. Sorry for that. <laughs> also, uh, take care of my son at the moment. But um, what really resonated with me is um, the examples that show you're really like engaging and what I, I struggle with in the, or, like, I mean, I'm quite new to the, to the field. I teach since three years, but um, I still have this mindset from university that sometimes it's not um, maybe um, grown up enough uh, to, to, mm -hmm. to do that at university, as you said, with the playfulness. And still, I, uh, I have this mindset that, oh, I'm a young teacher and then I'm coming with like new ideas. It might be too much or I'm not mm -hmm. brave enough to do so. And it was a great reminder in this uh, one and a half hours now that it's so important to listen to your gut feeling and think about yourself, what would you enjoy and not about, okay, what might other seniors think about you doing this in your class? It's a very good point, Magdalene. And, and acknowledge that, look, we're gonna bump into lots of forces in our cultural context that may be supportive or not. And part of, I think, what I've learned through the work with the professors is the real value that say Natasha and Christian have had in just connecting with each other. I mean, to find the relational support with other professors and because we can, we, you know, we're all in process. So let's just help each other through the process. Thank you. I see some uh, connections and extensions in the chat and I want to be mindful that we're coming to the bottom of the hour. So uh, just a quick uh, note about what's next. So if you're interested uh, I, there are some steps you can take. We do want to uh, point out that there's a partner who's been working with us called Sula Test. Um, we would like you to take a 15 minute self-assessment at the end. I'll, I'll put a QR code up in a moment. Um, it, it doesn't take very long, but it does give us some feedback about what you found useful. If you have any suggestions that you think we should take, keep in mind for future uh, workshops, uh, please fill that out. Um, you can read the playbook. If you're interested, go for it. If you've gotten to the end of this hour and a half and you're like, nope, not interested, that's fine too. <laughs> you know, do the things that are going to be the most supportive for you in your practice. Try something small. I mean, as Magdalena said, like, yeah, just try something. I mean, you might just have a small idea. But here's the other thing. 
don't do this alone. If you can find a friend or someone who can give you feedback, all the better. And if you can't find a friend, um, we have these things called I-5 cafes. And the next one is tomorrow. Uh, and there'll be professors who've been using these ideas. No one has like, no one's the expert. I mean, we're all trying different kinds of things, but you'll hear what people are doing and it might help you uh, continue with some experiments you'd like to try. So that's a, a little bit about what's coming up. Here's the self-assessment. If you could just take a picture of that, um, if you have a device, um, or if you just want to click on the, or I'm not sure you can click. I guess I can put this in. Do, do you have the self-assessment survey, Christian or Natasha, the link? I don't, but I can put it in the chat there. Oh, that would be terrific. Is that? Great. Thank you. So the link's right there. I want to be mindful that we're a, a minute over the bottom of the hour. If you would like to hang out for a few minutes and, and share, um, would love to hear any feedback or thoughts or questions. Um, otherwise, thank you each so much for carving out the time to be with us. Thank you, Natasha and Christian, for really I, I just opening you, the, your classroom up to us. It's always inspirational uh, to hear what other folks are doing. And um, I hope if folks have questions, they would feel you would feel okay if they followed up with you via email. But thank Absolutely. you, Chris and, and Natasha. <laughs> thank uh, again, each one of you. Um, have a good evening. Have a good sleep if you're going to bed. Have a good day if you're about to start your day. Um, take care, y'all. Thank you. Thank you. And Abir, do you have a question that you'd like to ask? Hi. Hi. Are you okay? Yeah, yeah, we can hear you. Thank you very much. Um, well, um, it, first of all, it's been wonderful um, session, and I do enjoy your these sessions quite a lot. I've had some uh, previous uh, discussions with Natasha uh, regarding a number of issues, and I'm enjoying the whole thing of uh, Prime and i5 and, and all of that. I've downloaded uh the booklet and started uh to read it and also to apply some of the ideas uh it's not really a question but maybe uh, more of a, a discussion point uh, because i use lego uh, series play and i'm a lego series play facilitator and i was trying to locate using lego within the framework of i5 um i thought it might be with the joyful and playful kind of uh, layout, but maybe I just thought to have a discussion around this point, and um, yeah, to just have a um, just an idea, just to to affirm what I have in mind for that, and whether it is possible to use that as part of the portfolio of this. Um, I have some thoughts, um, Natasha and Christian. Do you want to start though? Happy to. Christian just suggested we stop the recording now. Oh. Which is probably a good idea. <laughs> Thank okay, you. yeah. I don't mind. I don't mind. Uh, wait. Oh, I guess stop. Thanks, Christian, for reminding me.